everyone, and welcome to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice, and glad that you could be with us for this. I have to look. I lose track. It's episode number 41 as we get ready for the Breeders' Cup coming up this weekend at Santa Anita. And we'll tell you more a little bit later on about that. Uh, we'll be doing some live things uh, right around race time in case you want to tune in for that. But that is what is coming up now. Uh, on the show today, Lindsay Shanzer, who is one of the producers with NBC that's doing the Breeders' Cup this weekend. I've worked with Lindsay on several sports. We'll be talking about horse racing as it compares with some of the other sports out there. Also, Philip Shelton is with us with Medallion Racing. They have two horses, Cell Court and Street Band, that are running in Breeders' Cup races on Saturday. So we'll get a little insight about, again, another partnership because partnerships aren't about the future. They're about the now. So many in horse racing, it's really changed the whole scope of horse racing. You still have a few individual owners, a few individual farms, but they are becoming almost extinct. It's about let's get a group of guys together and maybe we all won't lose as much money. To be quite honest, that's what the name of that game is. And so we'll talk to uh, Philip and get some great insight. And then Lindsay will tell us all the things to prepare for as we get ready for the Breeders' Cup. Breeders' Cup. Let's see. I could turn to my right, and there is researcher Mr. Thomas Kenny, who has information about the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, I've been doing I've been doing a little homework yes. about the great second great North American classic. Yes. The Breeders' Cup. First being the Triple Crown, obviously. Yeah. But uh it actually the company behind the Breeders' Cup, which I believe is Breeders' Cup Limited, mm -hmm. started in nineteen eighty two. Yeah. But the first Breeders' Cup event wasn't until 84 wow started by mr john gaines yes quite the innovator mr gaines was yes and that's where we are today it's been hosted in north america every single time it's only been outside of the united states once that was in 1996 in canada at the woodbine racetrack yes which i believe is in toronto uh yes it is very good. It's going back to Santa Anita, I think, for the 10th time. Wow. Interesting as always. And now we've getting, we're, getting, we're at the point of history there where everybody likes to come up with top 10 lists. Now, I don't know. I was actually asked by the Breeders' Cup to do it for one of their streaming deals like two years ago or so. So I'm rattling off some. And then, you know, anytime you do that, somebody says, well, you forgot this one, you forgot that one, you forgot that and that one. And it's true. I don't know. I'll tell you some of them that stand out. They're just top of the head. Personal instant wing the distaff at 88 in the dark, in the mud. I mean, it wasn't completely dark, but it was just an overcast, dreary day uh, when she charges on the outside and beat uh, Winning Colors, among others, who was the uh, Derby winner that year. That's still one of the best races I've ever seen. That might be my best race I've ever seen. But you have to go back to the first year, Thomas, as you mentioned, in 84 is when this started. And they had such a classic finish in the classic with the outside shot that had been supplemented for like $350,000 wild again. It really set the tone. Hey, pay attention. What Mr. Gaines had in mind, bringing all the horses trying to around the world to compete in their divisions of, of gender and distance and surface, uh, this thing might work. And, and certainly it has. It's almost like a, a playoff of sorts. It is. You get the best of the best all together, and they're, like you said, their respective disciplines. Yeah. And it's for certain going to decide horse of the year this year. We're going to talk more about that later on. But, you know, some of the others, I remember when uh, Ferdinand uh, defeated Alex Sheba in 87 at uh, Hollywood Park. It was the first time that Derby winners had met in the Classic. Of course, Ferdinand the year before, and that current year was Alex Sheba in 87. Uh, and then the, the Grand Slam, which I don't think will ever happen again, because if a horse wins a Triple Crown again, as we saw with Justify, retired instantly. they're retired. But American Pharaoh, of course, after winning the Triple Crown out at Keeneland in 2015, won the Classic. You know, that's another great moment. Uh, the turf dead heat, the only dead heat ever in uh, Breeders' Cup history. I was there for that. High Chaparral and Joe Hare on the turf in 03 at Santa Anita. You know, those are just good memories. I don't know. I don't know if I could say what's the greatest ever. And then Zenyatta, this is the 10th anniversary of her beating the boys to win the Classic. See, they still come to us. <sighs> we'll jot them all down. What's coming up next is Lindsay Shanzer with NBC Sports, and we're going to talk about the coverage of this year's Breeders' Cup. Stay with us. Thank you for tuning in to Episode 41 of the Horse Racing Show.
Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in again this week on YouTube or listening to us on iTunes or Google Play. Now downloaded in 22 countries as well as just about every portion of the U.S. we've heard from. That's great because we have great guests like this that bring you more than just the, hey, wonder who's going to win the race. How about how things get done behind the scenes in horse racing, which also includes behind the scenes in producing horse racing and getting it on TV. And one of the best is Lindsay Shanzer. I've had the pleasure of working her with her for years at NBC. Lindsay will be one of the producers this weekend on the Breeders' Cup shows, and she joins us from the site right now. Lindsay, welcome in. Kenny, glad to be here. So now, how much preparation have you been doing already as we count down uh, this will air about two two days out from the Breeders' Cup? Yeah, you know, it's been uh, it's been quite a bit. It kind of shocks your system a little bit when you get into the Breeders' Cup. I forget every year just how much it is. Um, I'm lucky enough to work on the Triple Crown, and that's uh, a lot of content. You know, the Kentucky Derby, for example, is like a five-hour show on NBC, but... Um, here covering 14 world championships racing for several hours on Friday and then again on Saturday across the board. It, uh, like I said, it really shocks your system. So the preparation has been ongoing for weeks, um, months even. We've been kind of getting getting our arms around things, planning the physical production process, staffing, and making sure the logistics are in place. And then as the fields take shape and now that the draw is out, uh, really getting kind of the editorial in place and putting formats together. So we have a minute by minute plan of, of what's coming at you. And Lindsay, you know, I've always thought uh, when some of my friends will ask me that not everybody I know actually is into horse racing. And I know you know that, obviously, in your world covering all these other sports. But I have friends say, well, what's that Breeders' Cup like? I say, imagine if they had like a lot of playoff games in one day. I mean, like an <laughs> overload of playoff. You got all the NFL playoff games crammed into like one day is kind of like a yep. Breeders' Cup almost. <laughs> Totally. Um, it's one of the reasons I love this event. I mean, not that covering other horse racing isn't great also, but, um, you know, you're you're usually building up to whatever that featured race is. And there's certainly that here with the Breeders' Cup Classic, which is the ris richest of the races and the most, you know, carries the most prestige, let's say. But really, at the end of the day, every single race is important and the reactions are going to be um, they're going to be incredible for every single one of the 14 races because like I said they're world championships and it's 14 and it's you know one after the other after the other after the other and it means the world to every one of the connections who's involved with it and you know they're pretty pretty big time purses involved as well so uh, I, I love this event uh, it's non-stop action and excitement yeah it's kind of like a marathon that goes forward in a sprint motion isn't it because you know when we're out there and i'm listening to you tell me where you want me to go do an interview or not do an interview or whatever and then suddenly i realized wow we're like uh, we only got like two races to go it just zooms right. by I, it's it amazing just whips by. absolutely does it absolutely does i don't know where the time goes you know we've got what four hours on friday and uh, it'll go by in a flash Lindsay Shanzer, NBC, one of the producers who produces many other sports, works on many other sports. And uh, do you, is there any kind of correlations you can make between like horse racing and, and football or Olympic coverage or some of the other sports you work? Yeah, it's a really unique sport to cover. Um, I think for me, uh, for in, in some ways, obvious reasons, um, I kind of related to track and field in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, and definitely more Olympics coverage than something like football. Uh, there's a little bit of the football type element to it, but just to give you an idea of what kind of horse racing coverage is, it's a really a little bit more of a studio show than anything else with little pockets of, of live action that you have to react to, um, sort of squeezed in there across whatever the coverage is. So it can be very formatted, as I know you know from all right. the meetings that we'll do in, in yeah. any kind of event like this. Uh, like I said, you know, second by second, minute by minute plans for from tip to tail of coverage that say we're going to go to this place. We're going to talk about this horse. We're going to meet this connection, this interview, see this feature. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes has gone by and you're prepped to the race. And then there's the two minutes of action and we react to the live scene. And then all of a sudden you go right back to that studio atmosphere. Um, so it's really unique and that it's it's not one or the other like most of sport, most sports are. But in terms of coverage, when I say it's a little bit like track and field, the races are similar like that. Obviously, there's the round track and um, mm -hmm. the physical races are similar. But um, I find it to be like Olympic coverage and track and field coverage in particular because we really do our best to give you 
a reason to care about the race that's happening. And horse racing lends itself really well to to that. Even though we're working with animals, Mm -hmm. they all have human connections. So um, I really enjoy covering this sport because we get to introduce people more often than not, particularly in, in events like the Kentucky Derby where more people watch than maybe they do other races or the Breeders' Cup where you get a new and bigger audience you introduce people to connections they've never heard of before. You know, it could be Bob Baffert that they've never seen before, or it could be, you know, a group of Mongolian owners who've got a horse Mongolian groom in the classic. That's a major long shot, but you know, they're going to be, you know, 20, 30 of them in the winter circle going out of their minds like they were when they won last time. So I love that aspect of it, giving people a reason to root. You tell the stories of where they came from and, um, why they love what they're doing. And, um, that's, that's something I love. And I think that that is, that's similar to the way at least NBC does its Olympic coverage. Um, you know, not that I don't love telling stories about Tom Brady, but for the most part, (laughs) the majority of this country knows a lot about Tom Brady at this point. And by the way, I tip my hat to, um, you know, producer Fred Gadelli on Sunday night football, who finds new ways to tell you about Tom Brady, because God knows we know a lot about him, but Um, on the flip side with the Olympics and with horse racing, often I find we have a little bit more of a a clean slate to really introduce people to who we're, who we're covering. And, uh, you mentioned Fred, he was on our show early on when we were talking, we had a Super Bowl weekend show. We had, we had, uh, Fred and Bill Parcells on, uh, talking about football. (laughs) Yeah. And, but he, he pointed out, and I saw him right after the Derby this year. And we, we certainly know what happened after the Derby this year for, for 22 minutes. And he was oh just gosh, talking. About, oh, he was just talking about the unpredictability because I was saying, you know, unlike football, they they, they don't have a sports information uh, publicist bringing the trainers to you. It's it's kind of like That's you just right. go grab them. And he was saying, yeah, the unpredictability. First thing he says to me afterwards, he's walking out of the TV compound. I said, "What did we say about the unpredictability? Because we thought we'd seen everything, and then we had 22 minutes to decide the Derby winner." That's right. And then when it's it's something you've never seen happen before, you also realize some of those systems maybe aren't in place and it takes something like this to happen for those systems to be created. But it definitely makes that first time out a little bit more complicated. Yeah. And you know what? You brought up a perfect point talking with Lindsay Shanzer of NBC Sports. She'll be one of the producers of the Breeders' Cup coverage this week, which biasly I think is just outstanding. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm proud to be part of it. And so... Uh, and we're we're proud to have you with us. Oh, thank you. I wasn't fishing too much, was I? But thank you. But, but you know, you made the point, like, about Tom Brady. We know about that. It's like when I was a kid, sitting with my dad, watching baseball games, growing up a St. Louis Cardinals fan, they would always say, you know, runners on base, two men out, three, two count, runners going. You know, they still yep. say it the other night, the World Series. You know, it's <laughs> so we know that. But not everyone, and that includes me, grew up in the horse racing world, and so, you know, you could say, hey, they worked in 58 and 2 this morning. I, I don't understand. I know what it means now. You know, yep. b- back then I didn't. But that's the thing that I think you always have to kind of tell the story. You don't want to dumb it down. But I think most of the people tune in are casual horse racing fans or horse racing people that aren't into the inside baseball part of it. You're right. I mean, you make a really good point. Um, it's a, it's definitely a delicate balance that we have to, we have to find. Um, and you know, it varies a little bit based on show. Like I said, with the Kentucky Derby, you know, you have a majority brand new audience that really only watches horse racing maybe once a year. Um, and maybe you can, I, I, I don't want to use the, the phrase, dumb it down. Like you said, we, we try not to use that, but, um, you know, you, you really want to teach that audience a little bit, give them an opportunity to understand. But throughout the rest of the year, we try to do that as well because we don't right. we don't want to isolate anyone. We don't want to exclude anybody. Um, but you have to find a delicate balance because we also serve a niche audience that is uh, really passionate, made up of really passionate fans who love this sport and know it more than I do, frankly. And luckily, we have experts like yourself and the rest of our, our crew here um, that helps us get those points across. But we try to do we try to serve both audiences. So we try to teach and we try to inform the audience that is already pretty well aware and give them our expertise and and help them make maybe more informed, intricate decisions while also explaining something a little bit uh, far, you know, from 30,000 feet for, for the rest of the audience. But it's, it's definitely a little, it's more difficult with uh, a sport with a smaller audience throughout the year than something like football. We're talking with Lindsay Shanzer of NBC Sports, one of the producers of the Breeders' Cup coverage coming up Friday and Saturday on NBCSN. The Classic will be on NBC. 
When we come back, we'll talk a little more about uh, getting ready for the big shows this weekend here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show, episode 41. We get ready for the Breeders' Cup, and uh, no one better that I wanted to talk to this week than Lindsay Shanzer. She's one of the producers for NBC Sports, and it's a daunting task to put on all this live horse racing on both Friday and Saturday. You can see it on NBCSN. The Classic will be in prime time on NBC. And it's all on your shoulders, Lindsay. That's a lot of stuff. They you know, it's only half on my shoulders, in fact. I know. To be clear. <laughs> it's Billy so Matthews nearby. I share it. That's right. It's, it's That's Billy right. nearby, I know. He's not. He's not. So don't worry. You can say whatever you want about him. Okay. You know, we were talking earlier, and you compared it, I think, uh, astutely about the track and field in the Olympic competition to the Breeders' Cup because you have international competition, you have different distances, and you have a lot of different participants all coming together and not everyone is familiar with them and you've got a few hours to explain it all as you watch the action unfold that's right uh that's what we try to do and um you make a good point again about it i've even forgotten up until this point not only do we have uh you know 12 14 however many runners in each of these 14 world championship races but um they may not be familiar with each other and some are coming from across the pond and um, aren't used to these tracks and they've shipped over and um, are, are used to different running styles, what have you. And uh, we have to introduce people not only to the faces they may already be familiar with or who we are familiar with, but then we familiarize ourselves with, with people that we don't get to see throughout the year uh, or horses we don't get to see throughout the year. I've had famous trainers, and I won't embarrass them because I think it's happened to all of us reporters too at times, <laughs> is that you expect – you know, they don't know each other. It's, it's not that close fraternity that some people think from West Coast to East Coast. There's yeah. there's exceptions like a Baffert who, tra you know, Pletcher and these guys that train all over. But a lot of times I've had trainers ask me, uh, just curious, you know, in the past, you say, is that that guy? And I go, yeah, that's that guy. <laughs> you, you know, because like you said, it's not like football. It's it's not like, yeah. uh, you know, when, uh, you know, Notre Dame, I believe you know something about Notre Dame. Uh, a little something, yeah. I do. <laughs> so when your alma mater's out there playing, you probably are familiar with the coach of any of the schools they're playing. At least you know who he is from sight, you know. That's right. By the way, I wish you had brought up Notre Dame a week ago because now I'm uh, slightly I'm, embarrassed. I'm Now I'm sorry. Yeah, Domer. Boy, I guess I lost about two hits this weekend, didn't I? There. Sorry. I, <laughs> no, but you know, I want to ask you because because you, 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 know, you went to school there, and that's one of the iconic places. And I understand yep. Billy Joel's doing a concert there next year too. I believe. I just That's what I heard. Yeah. That's what I heard. Unfortunately, you'll you'll understand and appreciate this. Uh, I'm lucky enough to cover uh, what's actually probably my favorite event of the of the year in horse racing, uh, an event called Royal Ascot, which I'm, I'm sure this audience is familiar with. And yes. uh, the Saturday of Royal Ascot is the same day that Billy Joel will be at Notre Dame Stadium. So unfortunately, I don't see myself attending. Ah. But I'm a huge Billy Billy Joel fan. Oh, Humongous. Yeah, I, I've seen him probably. I think I've seen him like four times, including the fifth time I saw him with Elton John when they toured together. Uh, that was together my first several... ever concert. Really? It was. Yeah. Uh, that was. Well, that's starting at the top, isn't it? You know, you go see <laughs> those two guys good. together. It's, All downhill from there. It's just tough to <laughs> equal that. But you know, I was going to get you. You've been at one of the great venues many times at Notre Dame. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it's iconic, and I think. I remember I had a chance to interview Aaron Rodgers one time, and uh, I, you know I pointed out to him, you know, he's obviously plays in another iconic place, Lambeau Field, all the time for the Packers. Yeah. And he talked about Churchill Downs being similar to you oh. know places that you want to see. And, yeah. And and I think Santa Anita is probably certainly for horse racing fans and maybe maybe casual fans in general. You know, it's kind of like a, uh, you know, maybe it's not. Uh, it, maybe it's Dodger Stadium compared to Fenway Park or Wrigley <laughs> Field, but it's one of those places that's just great to see. Definitely. And, uh, I mean, listen, lucky for us and the business we're in, it looks great on television. And uh, there's nothing better than, you know, the unbelievable view of the St. Gabriel, Gabriel Mountains in the background, um, you know. We have something on this show that we call the gyro cam, which I'm not sure is the official name, but that's what we call it. And it's a camera essentially affixed to a moving vehicle. And that camera works along the backstretch and it moves in tandem with, you know, the horse likely in front or whatever, whomever. And you have that view of the mountains in the background and there's wow. just nothing like it as much as 
I love the the Twin Spires and Churchill Downs, and obviously that's iconic. There really is something special about being out here, and um, you can feel the history, obviously, of the great race place, and uh, the Breeders' Cup history is pretty extensive, so, yeah. you know, back for a record 10th time. Oh, it is. It's, it's one of my favorite places to go to, and uh, how many cameras, do you know how many cameras we'll have out there? Uh, you put me on the spot, no, and I'm I sorry. really take, should know I, this. I no, no, that's no, I okay. Should, I should have asked you in advance. I just know there's... You know, I, I was just, people ask me, I go, I don't know. You know, I know there's like, I look around, I see the other reporters, you know, I'll see like Brittany over there, Donna's over there, Nick's over there. We all got cameras. I, was, I don't there know, there's like seven, or, we, there's like 40 cameras have, or something. It's crazy. Definitely. We have at least 50 cameras on, on the Kentucky Derby and it's yeah. not quite as many as, as the Derby, but it, it's, it's north of, you know, it's, it's up in, in that, uh, 30 to 40 range. Absolutely. It's, it's pretty extensive coverage here we, we absolutely have the grounds covered and like you said you know we have uh we're lucky to have a lot of roving reporters who can really get access to different connections and be in the right place at the right time to make sure we have all the information we need and uh we're lucky to have the camera complement to support you guys so and, and, yeah. we have a lot of moving cameras and it's so much bigger than a football game i mean the the expanse mm -hmm. of a of not just santa anita but a track in general be it at belmont or be it at churchill downs that's a lot of area to cover you know, and it is, it is, it makes it really, really <laughs> difficult. And, uh, you know, it makes it interesting and fitting, making the puzzle pieces work is really exciting. Um, and it's something I really enjoy about the job. It's, uh, it's definitely a unique challenge. Like you said, you compare it to something like a football game or a basketball game, a hockey game where there's a fixed field of play. Um, and you know, the track is a field of play, but we're, we're not just covering the track. We're really covering the venue and, um, it, it's, it's immense. So we want to be able to get into all kinds of places and in order to get signals from di different places, particularly inside this track is not easy. So, mm -hmm. uh, we have all kinds of cameras. We have aerial coverage, we have cabled handheld cameras, roving cameras, um, steady cam cam cameras that will, you know, make sure you're not dizzy when we're following the horses <laughs> out in the post parade, yeah. Um, high cameras to make sure we're following the action, scissor lift cameras all over the place, uh, just to make sure we have every piece of the grounds covered. And from a social standpoint, I don't know if there's a more social sport. I, I realize there's tailgating huge in football. Believe me, you grew up in the South, you know, tailgating in football. It's like, a, you know, they have they state laws, by the way, in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, they have to tailgate. I believe it's state laws. So you know, oh, how, wow. yeah, you know how big that tailgating stuff. So it's all social. We know a lot of sports, but you know, horse racing, they kind of dress up. You mentioned like Royal Ascot in the Kentucky yeah. Derby, and we'll see it at the Breeders' Cup. I think there's probably more fashion, um, oh, I guess fashion sensitive people going to these than most most sporting events I go. To. I don't see them at boxing matches. In other words, definitely definitely not people dress a certain way when they come to horse horse racing events and and the bigger events get i think the more fashionable people or the people that um put more into what they're wearing this you know a, the derby the breeders cup like i said is is definitely one of them and uh you know the fact that we're in santa anita which is just in the shadow of los angeles there's a sense of hollywood glamour that's always always been a part of a breeders cup that's associated with santa anita and uh it's just it just makes for a great event. Like you said, it's social. And um, I, I don't get the chance, unfortunately, to go to a lot of racing because I'm usually covering it. But mm -hmm. when I do, you know, it, it's a blast. It's a uh, it's a great event to go to with a group of friends and you get dressed up, which, you know, you don't necessarily always get the chance to do when you're going to an event that's social. Like you said, you can um, if you're of age, partake in <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, drinking. Look, there's going to be great food here. I know they have celebrity chefs all over the grounds. Um, and then, of course, there's there's the betting. You can you can get involved and feel like you really have a stake in what's happening. And um, it's it's allowed. It's happening on site, and um, you can be invested from from tip to tail. Well, it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be an exciting time, and it's going to be a lot of work for Lindsay Shanzer <laughs> and all the people at NBC behind the scenes while the rest of us roam around and talk to people. And uh, uh, it will, but it will. But I have uh, I should just say I have the absolute best crew in the world, and uh, the folks on on NBC's horse racing coverage are are the absolute best. And it's a big crew of um, over two hundred people we have here working between cameras, production, everything. Um, and I believe it's the best in the business. So we're, we're pretty lucky. Well, thank you. And thank you for being on with us. And I will see you uh, 
in about like a day. So, <laughs> and, and we'll start having meetings and get ready. Can't wait. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay Thanks, Shanzer. Kenny, safe travels. Thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay Shanzer from NBC Sports. She'll be one of the producers on all the Big Breeders Cup coverage this weekend on the network. And we'll be back with more on the horse racing show right after this. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for watching us on YouTube, for liking and subscribing on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at Horse Racing Show. Listen at iPlay, uh, iTunes, and Google Play. Now in over 20 countries, we have been downloaded. A man that's probably been to most of them that puts together uh, sales for TaylorMade Farm in Kentucky and heads up their medallion racing joins us now from Los Angeles near the Breeders' Cup. Here is Philip Shelton. Philip, thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kenny. I appreciate it. Okay, so Medallion Racing, it, it's part of TaylorMade Sales, but uh, it, it's separate from them. And you have two horses, Street Band and Cell Court, running in the Breeders' Cup. Did I simplify that enough? Yeah, yeah. We're, it's, a, it's, it's a TaylorMade branded product is the way we like to talk about it. But basically, you know, our goal is to bring this exclusive ownership experience to a group of people. Um, you know, we've, we've had started probably two years ago we've had about 110 starts at this point and you know we've run in almost 30 grade ones this will be our fourth third and fourth breeder breeders cup starters running the last two kentucky oaks so it's um you know taylor made has kind of allowed us to do that just from the brand name but it's um it's a great partnership and the way i understand this uh, not only are you kind of looking to buy horses but you will buy into groups that already are having some success with horses is that correct yeah, you know, our goal is we, we only buy fillies, and our goal is that we want to lower the downside risk on the initial investment, and we want to provide, you know, again, this exclusive ownership experience. Um, over almost 70% of our races come in graded stakes. It's all across the U.S. and the world. Like, we had our first uh, international starter. We had a filly run in a grade two at Royal Ascot, um, you know, so we're, we're all across. We have graded stakes winners at Del Mar. Um, you know, Santa Anita, Oaklawn, Churchill, you know, Keeneland, it's all across the, all across the country. So uh, by buying into a proven horse, there's a locked in residual. So we may buy in and say, you know, if you go buy a yearling, it's a hundred percent risk. Right. And it could be more than that. It could be 130% with future expenses, et cetera. If we go buy into a proven performer, maybe it's just 25% risk. And we know the level at which they can perform. Um, what it does is it takes away, you know, uh, somebody that buys Seattle slew for 17,000 and then he goes on and wins the triple crown and they, you know, they've, you know, a million times their money. So, right. And everybody that probably wants to buy in will cite that or more recently, like a funny side and say, Hey, Philip, how about, uh, I don't know, what can we get for 17,000? That's going to win grade one races for us. Yeah, that's exactly right. And what I always tell them is you never hear about the, the, uh, you know, the, the thousand other horses that bring 17,000 that, that don't work, but it, it's definitely a home run game. You know, we're, we're fortunate that um, we've had a, a, a lot of luck and we've bought into a lot of good horses with a lot of great trainers and other owners, but it, it's definitely a home run game. You know, when you go buy a yearling or a two year old in training, or even some of the ones that, you know, that we're buying, um, you know, it's a dream to be in the position that we're in to have two breeders cup starters. Um, and you know, that's what you hope for. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Talk with Philip Shelton, who hands, uh, he is the leader of the medallion racing. It's a uh, part of TaylorMade. I have some friends that I know are in with Philip on this, uh, in with some of the horses, uh, that are running out there. If I wanted to get in with you, if somebody listening right now says, Philip, I want to get in with medallion racing, they contact you is, is there kind of a, a bottom line that you, you know, if you don't have this much money, really, let's be realistic. You can't get in. You know, are are there? What I would say is there are a lot of great partnerships around there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for Medallion, our baseline is it, it's it's a fifty thousand dollar investment, and you know, my goal is over the course of two years, I want to give you your fifty thousand back, and you've been able to travel the country and and go to all these great races. Um, you know, that's kind of of our goal. There, you know, there are definitely lower buy-ins. There's even there's a group out there called My Racehorse that we're yeah. partners with on Street Band, and they'll sell you a hundred dollar share in a horse. Yeah. Um, you know, the access that that both of our partnerships grant is obviously a lot different because it's a different level of of buy-in. But 
you know, that's what we we focused on. And, and our goal is, again, we want it to be exclusive so that it's a limited number of partners. Somebody has an issue or they want to know they can just pick up the phone and call me and they know that I'm going to answer. And, uh, we, you know, we try to provide that personal touch to make it, you know, so that it's an experience uh, along with owning the horses, but that, that everybody can can really get this exclusive experience that's not available to the general public. And you mentioned you you deal with uh, dish staffers. Basically, it's fillies only, and the reason for that would be breeding, I guess, obviously. Right. They just have a residual. You know, if if, if a colt, uh, the way I explain it to everybody, and I've explained it to some of your buddies, is, you know, there are like 11,000 colts born every year, and about 12 of them have value when they're done running. Mm-hmm. The other 10,988, are worth their future expense. Now, racing has done a great job and they've continued to do more and there's more that's needed for aftercare for geldings. But of the of the 11,000 colts, very few of them have any value. Now, the ones that do are worth millions. A filly, there's 11,000 of them born and you know 10,000 of them have some value. And when you buy and you know what that value is, I could tell you, you know, Street Band, when we bought into her, we basically paid a 50% premium over what she was worth. So if she got hurt the next day, we were getting 50% of our money back, even if she never ran Mm -hmm. where if you go buy into a Derby hopeful and depending on what they've done at that point, but if they are not a grade one winner and you go buy in, it's a hundred percent of a premium. Wow. So it's just a different, a different market, you know, for different people. And I applaud the people that, you know, Starlight and some of the other guys that have done it. And there's certainly a market market for it. It's just something we've just focused our, our focus is somewhere else. And a lot of that is due to the connection with TaylorMade. When TaylorMade, mm-hmm. when the horse is done running or the partnership, they all have, it's a two year partnership. So at the end of two years, everything that we own will go to auction Yeah, and we'll just liquidate. But because of the association with TaylorMade, TaylorMade, if like in Street Band, we own 25%. At some point when she sells, TaylorMade will sell 100%. So they make commission on the 25% medallion owned plus the 75% that medallion doesn't own. By doing that, we don't have to mark the horses up. So it's a little bit more of an investor-friendly model mm-hmm. because we have a revenue stream outside of just marking a horse up or charging fees to the owners to like pay my salary, cover my travel expense, pay for accounting, et cetera. Because that's one of the things that not all, but some partnerships like you just mentioned, and it's like with any of us, it's like when you have somebody come over and work on your house, it's that hidden fee thing that drives people nuts sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it does me just as a homeowner when you say, I didn't know, well, wait a minute, we had to cut that tree. Why do you tell me you were going to cut that tree down to start with, you know? Yeah, what I would say is I actually think a lot of the other partnerships, and and I think, again, they're – everybody kind of focuses on something different. And I think that's what makes it great is that, you know, if you want to buy a micro share, there's my resource. If you want to go in and buy a bunch of yearlings, there's West Point or Eclipse or Little Red Feather. Mm -hmm. And all of them have their own positives and negatives. Um, And I actually think they're all very upfront with what they do. And it's all pretty transparent. Um. But it's, yeah, it's just a different thing. And we're just very fortunate that we don't have to charge the markup. And because it's associated with TaylorMade and like I'm a techno, I'm a TaylorMade employee. I have other responsibilities at TaylorMade. It just makes it easier for an investor. And like if you, if you're invested with us, you want a piece of every horse. So we have 11 horses. We have two running in the Breeders' Cup. We had one that was pre entered that didn't get in. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you get a piece of everything for West Point or Eclipse or some of these other guys that do a great job. It's so it's a one horse thing, which, you know, brings in the home run factor, kind of like we talked about earlier. If you buy into, you know, uh, West Point, I think, bought into Always Dreaming. And if you bought into that, then, you know, it was a great deal. You won the Kentucky Derby. Right. Uh, there's no <laughs> no better thing. So it's just a different different model. And the the, you know, t- being part of TaylorMade gives us a lot of a lot of opportunities to do something that's a little bit non-traditional. We're talking with Philip Shelton. He handles uh, medallion racing, a syndicate, a partnership that has two horses in the Breeders' Cup. Stay with us. We're going to talk about those horses, Street Band and Selcourt, in just a moment here on the Horse Racing Show.
Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in again this week. We're having a fascinating conversation with Philip Shelton. He works at TaylorMade Farm. He also handles medallion racing. They have two horses, Street Band and Selcourt, that are running this weekend in the Breeders' Cup. And we were just talking about... Uh, adding up the figures and and really philip you've explained it great this is like going to class for those people listening out there i hope they get in contact with you and medallion racing if they want to get into this business because the way you explain it uh it makes a whole lot of sense and i think it clears up things that some people might be a little little standoffish about racing i don't know if i get into this and then i got to keep paying you know the horse is going to eat and have medical bills even if uh, she's not running so you know you know i think a lot of people step back from that a little bit yeah and what i tell you know everybody is is it's just like anything else when you wade into anything the best thing you can do is go slow try to learn as much as you can Mm -hmm. advocate for yourself and your interests because everybody's goal are different you know i have some guys in in that we've had two partnerships they were the first one i said you know what i really want to have a derby horse and i said that's great this is this isn't the right the right partnership for you and just it's it's all about you know at the end of the day if you're investing in horses it's somewhat discretionary income and so with whatever you do whether it's a membership at a golf club vacations it's all about where do you get your level of enjoyment Mm -hmm. and it's trying to fine tune you know, what is going to make you happy, what's going to make your experience the best. And that's how you should invest your money, whether it's, you know, again, any, any sort of discretionary um, expense. So that's our kind of goal is we focused on one experience that we think is great. And we're, you know, we're going to have, I think we have 12 investors, eight of them are going to be at the Breeders' Cup. So it's, it's going to be a great weekend. Now let's talk about the, the fillies you got running in the Breeders' Cup. First off, fillies and mare sprint, uh, Selcourt opening at 10 to one in the morning line. What about her coming into this race? You know, she, she was coming off of a layoff. So she's, this will be her second start since March. She mm-hmm. came back, got beat a nose in the LA woman, um, at the beginning of October at Santa Anita. She's a Philly. She's very fast. Um, she set the fastest opening quarter and opening half mile for any six and a half for a long race at the Santa Anita autumn meet. So she's a filly, you know, she drew the seven. It looks like Kafefe, Danuska's my girl, are the other two logical speed contenders. They drew the one and the two. Mm-hmm. So I think from that perspective, we got a really good draw. I think we have Luis Saez, who's going to ride her for the first time. He is one of the top speed riders in the country. And, you know, I think she's just going to basically break and then see what the one and the two draw. I, I'm not I'm not 100% sure she can rate, to be completely honest. Yeah. Um, she's kind of one of these fillies, much like a uh, – uh, a, a woman and, and especially I always say my wife you're better off when you just let her do what she wants <laughs> yeah. and if you start trying to yank on her or try to rate her or try to push her she just just doesn't feel like she relaxes as well so you know I think our instructions to Luis will just be break out of the gate and get her happy and I think that'll be she'll be very forward I don't know if it'll be on the lead depending on what the other two do but um, she worked a bullet last weekend at Santa Anita, so she's coming into the race in really good form. I think she'll move forward. Uh, second start off the layoff, she actually she got hooked and battled back, um, and then she actually galloped out ahead of the horse who's also in this race named Lady Ninja. Mm-hmm. But she's a filly. I think she's doing really well. Um, I actually think come dancing on the card is one of the most likely winners of the whole Breeders' Cup weekend. Yeah. So for us – an on the board finish would be a, a great result. And I think anytime you have a lot of natural speed, you're very dangerous, especially at Santa Anita. It can, it can play very speed friendly. Um, so we'll have to see how the track plays on Thursday and Friday. Um, you know, we're, we're the first breeders cup race on Saturday, so we won't get as much of a chance on Saturday to see how it plays, but always one of my very dangerous. Yeah. And, and you know, one of my favorite races always is the disc staff. Uh, Midnight Bizu going for for maybe a horse of the year, depending on how everything else shakes out. She's certainly in the mix. And in that race will be from Medallion Racing that Philip Shelton heads up. Street Band at 10 to 1 as well. And yeah, how does she know, look? I, yeah, she, you know, she's doing great. It was it was funny. Every, I flew out to California on Sunday. She had her final work at Churchill um, yesterday morning on Monday. And everybody's was texting like, Hey, did she work? Did she work? Because it was so foggy at Churchill. Uh, there's actually a couple of videos floating on Twitter, but they actually couldn't clock her. Um, 
but I text Sophie Doyle who rides her and also gets up for all of her works. And she's like, Oh no, she went great. You know, no problems. It was just too foggy for the clockers, but you know, she's doing really well. She's a horse. I just give full credit to Larry Jones and his team. Yeah. We bought into her after she won the fairgrounds. Oaks. she was getting ready to run in the Kentucky Oaks and she was a Philly. I mean, she just was on the muscle a hundred percent of the time when she came out of her stall and her stall, she's one of the sweetest horses there is. But when she comes out of her stall, it's just all business all the time. And after the Oaks, Larry just said, he said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to go slow with her. She's keeps herself really fit. We're going to only work her like every two weeks, which nowadays in the thoroughbred business, every horse works almost every seven days. It's like, if they don't, it's normally because there's an issue. Right. And he said, you know, we're going to do, go this plan. We're going to try to get her to relax, mature a little bit. And then she won the Indiana Oaks on that plan. So we're like, all right, this is, you won pretty convincingly. Wow. He said, we're going to do the, he said, we're going to do the same thing. And then she went and ran third in the Alabama on the slop against Dunbar road one. Who's, who's back from the distaff. And then he said, we're going to do the same thing into the cotillion. And you know, it worked, it worked perfectly. Now she's almost, she's a completely different horse and it's a hundred percent due to the training that they they've gotten and it's you know it's just they've every horse is different and what every horse needs is completely different and the best trainers from from bob baffert to chad brown to larry jones it's all about figuring out what each horse needs and then being gutsy enough to alter your plans and change so that you can give every horse what what they need well listen you've done a great job with medallion racing i know for a fact because restaurateur bruce drake and uk football coach mark stoops tells me well, I, we're we're very fortunate. They're great guys, and um, you know we're we're hoping we can have some success over the weekend. It's a bye week for UK football, so hopefully, hopefully, Coach Stoops is tuning in, and we'll we'll have we'll have some success. Hey, Philip, thank you for your time, and all the best out there with the uh, Street Band and Cell Court, and continued success with Medallion Racing. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kenny. I appreciate it. All right. Philip Shelton from Medallion Racing. They've done a great job, and they've got two horses running in the Breeders' Cup this weekend. More when we come back on the Horse Racing Show. We get ready now to wrap up episode number 41 here of the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks to Lindsay Shanzer, a producer with NBC. Uh, who will be part of the big, big shows this weekend on NBCSN and the classic on NBC. That'll be Friday and Saturday Breeders' Cup coverage. Philip Shelton with Medallion Racing, how to put a partnership together. That was pretty interesting about why they go with Phillies instead of going with Colts, wasn't it, Thomas? Yeah. Makes I'm particularly excited for the disc stuff this year, so I was... Yeah. You know. I, th- I think it'll be a great race. Scott Hall our lead guitarist and bass player and percussion, everything else. Uh, uh-huh. I know do you have a race that you're most looking forward to. You know, I think honestly, after today, I hate to be a follower on this, but the distaff, I mean, that's the one. Yeah. And you know, at midnight, and we're going to talk more about this. We're going to go live right from Santa Anita on Saturday. That's right. Uh, people will be able to check it out. We'll be sending you notice on, on Twitter and I guess Facebook and all that. Right. Uh, about, about 11 a.m. Yeah. 11 Eastern for, time, yeah, eight Pacific Eastern, time. Right. Uh, Midnight Bijou very much in the hunt for horse of the year. Matoli has an outside shot. Bricks and mortar certainly on the turf. I have a feeling, though, it's the winner of the classic. If that winner is either uh, McKenzie or Code of Honor, that they would be horse of the year. But that's why they have the Breeders' Cup, you know, for these kind of moments. This is about as wide open as a horse of the year race I can remember. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's up in the air completely. And I don't know. I know McKenzie's the favorite. They always have the question, can they go the distance? You know, can they get that mile and a quarter? And uh, as many great trainers have said, well, that's why we run the race. And that's why they will. And we'll be there covering it. And we'll talk a lot about it all next week. Thank you for tuning in to this episode number 41. For Scott Hall, Ben Chaffins, Mr. Thomas Kenny, and our great guests. I'm Kenny Rice. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll talk next week.